everybody. We're just going to get started here. Um, welcome tonight. We're uh, for the second night of the UPI Student Union Alumni, our Inspiring Alumni uh, series. Um, we have an awesome speaker today, Dr. Greg Fleming. Um, so uh, my name is Katie Lee, and I'm a third year veterinary student at the Atlantic Vet College. Um, and I guess I'll be your MC tonight. Um, so um, how it's going to go tonight is Dr. Fleming is going to give his talk, and then we're going to have a 10-minute question period, and there's going to be a reception to follow in Skirman Market Square just down the hall. Um, yeah, so Dr. Fleming it was an ABC graduate in 1998. He now resides in Florida where he's a boarded veterinarian in zoological medicine at Disney's Animal Kingdom, which is pretty special. Um, and I had the uh, joy of listening to some of his talks earlier this week, and he's always entertaining, so we've come to learn. And um, so he's a pretty awesome guy, and he's been to Africa like 15 times, I think he said, working on rhinos and elephants and hippos and all kinds of wild and wonderful things. So he'll be an awesome speaker here tonight, so I hope we all enjoy. And if you can uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Fleming up here to speak for us, that'd be great. All right, thanks, thanks, Katie. So I just want to make sure there's not enough glare for the camera guy up there. No, I'm okay? Okay. I had that happen at Disney once. Um, <laughs> We were doing a production for a German television company, and we did the take, and the, the guy came up, and I'm going to imitate German here, so I'm sorry if you're German. But uh, he came up, he goes, where's the powder? And he poof, and hit me on the head. <laughs> take two. So, but then Jay told me tonight, same thing happened with Darcy Shaw here once. He had a bit of, <laughs> bit of glare, bit of glare in the front row, so. All right, so. Um, like Katie said, um, I'm a grad of ABC in 1998, and uh, now I work for Disney's Animal Programs and Environmental Initiatives. And um, that's a long title, but um, really what it is is I work at Disney's Animal Kingdom, and we look after the animals. But more than that, um, just recently the park has been opened like 10 years ago, so we're the newest addition to Disney. And within that, before that, Disney really didn't have um, a lot of animal people or conservation-minded people working there. And since the formation of Disney, we've been really instrumental in um, taking the company uh, to new levels of conservation and as well as taking the company, hopefully, into kind of a more green uh, workspace. And so we've been, that's what the whole environmental initiatives is about. And um, our new uh, CEO, has actually um, made it a part of uh, our company policy now that we're going to be trying to take Disney green. Because then once we go green, uh, because Disney's such a big place, we force all the people we uh, work with to go green. So I guess that'll be good in the long run. So I first of all want to thank uh, the University of Prince Edward Island and ABC for having me. And I'm, I'm, I'm a very proud uh, alumnus of ABC. I always uh, say that in my talks when I'm in the States and abroad, and a lot of my American colleagues end up torturing me um, when they introduce me, saying there's vet schools in Canada and stuff like that. Uh, who knew? And uh, <laughs> that's OK, because I give my revenge eventually. But um, I really want to thank uh, Tim Cullen. He's the president of the um, student union here. He's been excellent in arranging everything and getting me down here and driving me around through the terrible, disgusting weather you have. Um, <laughs> that I'm not used to anymore. And Dr. Lisa Miller for hosting me. And uh, Dr. Miller was uh, one of my faculty when um, I was here as a student. So I also really wanted to thank uh, all the professors and staff of ABC. <clears throat> And I've been lucky uh, through my training, and I'll talk about it in a minute, I've traveled around quite a bit and worked at a number of very large American universities and vet schools. And uh, they may be good and they may be large, but it's, they're no ABC. And I think the thing, the difference is, is that we have some very highly trained people. They also have highly trained people. But really, ABC is a real family kind of place. And uh, um, I think the faculty really care about the students, and it's good. So in other places, I'm sure they do, but it's not the same feeling. So um, I think this is a very special place, and I think it continues on to today. And so uh, I think uh, I'd give the faculty a clap. <laughs> And, it, and it's not just the faculty, it's all the staff there. And, you know, I came back and looking around the school, and everyone's still there. So 
for example, like Donna, I saw it down in ICU. She's still there, you know, have trained thousands of vet students and, you know, on and on. So um, these are the people that really run the place, unfortunately, uh, for the professors that like to think they're running it. <laughs> And I also wanted to um, kind of pay some homage uh, to Dr. Hyder and Dr. Ogilvie. And Dr. Hyder was a dean when I was at the vet school, and uh, Dr. Ogilvie was there, and he was on the dean's council. And um, when, I, when I was there, we had, uh, there was only a few of us really interested in some exotics and wildlife and that kind of thing. And they were very good in hearing me out because I wanted to uh, add extra external rotations so we could actually do some of these things. Um, and we hadn't really done that in the past for the school, but I wanted to fight for the whole, uh, you know, all students. So if someone wanted to maybe go do an opthor rotation or something, and we kind of discussed that. And then after that, they kind of changed the policy and allowed, um, allowed that. So I think it was very, um, very good forward thinking. Um, you know, we might not have every specialist at the vet school, but it doesn't matter because the, the core of what you need is there. And uh, you're getting a really excellent base, you know. Um, you can't build a pyramid without that wide base, and uh, you know you can't just go straight to the top. So, I think uh, you know my training, and I see a number of my friends that have uh, all gone through AVC, and um, that training does pay off. And it's because of uh, Dr. Hyder and Dr. Ogilvie's vision, and um, all the professors and staff once again. So first of all, even though I'm boarded in zoo and I do zoo stuff and it's great, um, I've got a lot of friends um, and other alumni from AVC uh, that have all done a bunch of other really cool stuff. So if you think you can't just do it in zoo medicine, there are people all over the place. So I'm going to go through some of them right now. And these are all like really some of my best friends and, and roommates that I've had through vet school. So the first one's Dwayne Rogerson. I think his dad's here tonight. I talked to him earlier. Dwayne's from the island. And uh, I like to bug him about that. So, um, and he says I'm an Islander wannabe, and I guess that's probably right. Um, but uh, Dwayne <coughs> is an equine surgeon, and he's down in, in Kentucky and Lexington at Hager, Davis, and McGee, and he's probably one of the top uh, equine surgeons in the world. And so he was a few years ahead of me at AVC. But when I was at um, doing my residency at the University of Florida, he was there as a faculty member, and. Another guy that was a year ahead of me, Curry Keowen, and some of us are surprised Curry's still alive. He was a bit of a crazy guy from the North Shore of New Brunswick. Um, he's a boarded surgeon as well, and he actually is the head um, vet at the Singapore Jockey Club in Singapore. He was also the crown prince of Saudi Arabia's vet for a number of years. It's true. And he had to steal his passport to get out, so uh, that's a, <laughs> ask him about that. Um, it's true. <laughs> Tanya Grondon, um, she was a classmate of mine. She was just boarded in clinical pathology, and her husband Shane DeWitt was a year behind of me. He's boarded in internal medicine uh, in the equine variety, and they live in Virginia now. Um, a really good friend of mine, Diane Phillips, also a St. FX alumnus, um, she's boarded in internal medicine. She works in Massachusetts veterinary specialists along with uh, Gina Silver. Um, and Gina is the person I um, graduated St. FX with. We were really good friends at St. FX. And um, I'll talk about it in a second, but Gina was here at AVC, and I was back in Alberta, and I actually graduated with a business degree, so I was a banker for a number of years before I went back to vet school. And um, I called her one day, and she was saying how great vet school was and how I should have you know, gone to vet school, because I had all these exotic animals and stuff when I was at X. And uh, so she basically convinced me to go back to vet school, and I decided, and that's why I decided to come here, too, because she uh, said such good things about the people that were out here. And then um, a roommate from vet school, Rodney Belgrave, he's um, from Trinidad originally, and he came here, and he's boarded in internal medicine equine um, in um, New Jersey. So these are just a small handful of people that were my best friends um, that are all over the United States and Canada practicing really high-quality medicine. And, you know, you don't think the people around you make a difference, but, you know, you'll be calling these people. I call these guys all the time. Uh, for example, I had to call Dwayne about a month ago. We had a hippo that cut its, lacerated its leg really bad into a joint capsule. So I kind of knew what to do, but I wanted to see if there's anything um, different that um, we could do for this hippo um, that he would do for a horse. And I had to talk to Gina the other day about a neurologic hippo as well. So um, these people really play a great role in your, your career. So I just wanted to quickly go over my road, to, uh, how I got to Disney. A lot of people always ask me, especially for the students, well, 
I graduated from St. FX uh, with a Bachelor in Business Administration and then was a banker for a number of years in Alberta. But I'd always had lots of exotic animals and my parents um, were very good and they let me have all kinds of crazy stuff in the house and lots of stuff was escaped and um, my sister was good. Everyone was really good about that. And so they weren't surprised, I think, when I said I wanted to go back to vet school. But because I did a business degree, um, I first had to go back and do an additional year of science. So I went to UNB and lived with a couple of buddies from St. FX that were in law school. And, um, and sorry, Tim, I hate to tell you this, but um, now I know why I wasn't a lawyer. Um, I think we may have made a better choice <laughs> going to vet school. Um, so I did that, and then I applied to ABC that year and uh, actually got in. So I was very excited, but then I actually deferred a year um, because I took a diploma in endangered species management at a zoo in the United Kingdom called the Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust. It was always kind of a dream of mine. And this is a zoo run by a guy named Ger Gerard Durrell. He's actually dead now. And you might have seen, they used to have TV shows about him here. And uh, so I worked there and learned about endangered species management. And then after that, I worked uh, for about half a year in Africa um, catching crocodiles. So it was pretty good. So that started me in, into vet school. And then here I was at PEI, um, some of the best years. And then after that, I decided, well, you know, I really want to go on and do zoo animal medicine and become board certified. And at that time, there's only two Canadians boarded in zoo, veteran, uh, zoo vet medicine, and they're, they're both my buddies, so I can make fun of them. So I'll say, you know, when I got uh, boarded, and I was the third one at that point, and they're both from Quebec, and so being from Alberta, I had to say, well, you know, really, I'm the first one, because you French guys don't count. And uh, <laughs> so that's all right. They knew I was kidding. And they said, we can take that one back. And I said, yeah, OK, whatever. <laughs> So, um, so I actually went and did a year in private practice, and why I did that, I was telling the students today, is if you go into zoo medicine, sometimes you're going to be lucky to say, see the same thing twice. Like uh, a week ago, I had a neurologic hippo that went down in his back end, couldn't walk. You know, I probably won't see another neurologic hippo, hopefully, um, in my life. So, so what you have to do is you have to hone your skills, and you have to be good at medicine and be able to do the regular things and surgery as well. So I went to private practice to kind of hone that up and doing spays, and, and I went to a private practice in um, Pennsylvania that had lots of exotic animals and uh, dogs and cats, and there was 10 vets there, and I learned a lot. And then I proceeded to do my uh, internship at Kansas State University under a guy named Jim Carpenter, who's a very well-known uh, zoo vet. And then I did a four-year residency at the University of Florida, and by this time my dad's going, what are you doing when you're going to actually do something? <laughs> well, he said that for about 10 years, but... Um, and then finishing the residency, I got boarded in zoo medicine, and now uh, I was number 77, and that was a very good number for me. Um, and now there's about 105 uh, boarded zoo veterinarians worldwide. And actually, um, good news, I, uh, the dean was telling me today that you guys have actually hired one of them, and that she's going to be coming here, so that'll be great. Um, so you get some more training in zoo and wildlife medicine. So Disney's animal, well, my job is more than just Animal Kingdom. We look after a lot of places. So we look after Animal Kingdom, and then um, we look after something called Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge. It's a very large uh, resort that's right beside Disney. Uh, Animal Kingdom, sorry, it's in, within the Disney property. And we have about 1,500 rooms there, and they all face onto the savanna, an African savanna. And then we have all the animals on the savanna. So it's like living in Africa, you go on your balcony and there's giraffes or ancoles or flamingos or whatever right there. Um, we also look after all the marine mammals of the living seas at Epcot. So I do uh, dolphins and manatee medicine. Um, which a lot of people are like, oh, you do dolphins? And I'm like, if I have to. It's kind of like horses. Um, <laughs> sorry. They're very smart, and that's the problem. Um, and we also look after horses um, at the Tricircle D Ranch, and including some very famous horses. You can see here Cinderella's ponies. And I'll tell you, they're not nice. <laughs> no. And they're small, little white nasties, so. And I grew up on a quarter horse farm, so I, I know horses. Um, so we have to look after all those. Luckily, we actually have a contract vet who's an equine vet that does 99% of the stuff over there. And occasionally, we get a call. Oh, we've got a colicking horse. And we all kind of look at each other. Who gets to go palpate this horse? So Disney's really built a foundation on animals. And I, I kind of look around this crowd. And sometimes I give this talk um, to some 
you know, vet student crowds, and some, some of the students are looking at some of these images and go, who are those? And so I look around this room and I see some people of more appropriate age, and so a lot of you guys will know who most of these characters are. So over the years, Disney has really taught, you know, had a lot of animals in their animation, and if you remember the Disney Nature series um, on Sunday nights, I'm sure we all remember on CBC, Disney's Wonderful World of Disney, sorry, uh, with the nature documentaries. And um, so the, he, Walt Disney was very into that. And they've actually redone those uh, nature doc documentaries a couple years ago. So um, this is our founder at Disney, and he said, uh, you've probably heard people, um, oh, it's right behind his head, talk about conservation. Well, conservation isn't just the business of a few people. It's a matter that concerns all of us. And so he said that in 1956, and that was probably about 40 years before most other people were saying it. And so, um, you know, we've kind of hung our hat on this at, uh, at Animal Kingdom because we really want to, um, you know, go along with that, and the company has been very good in allowing us to do that. So first of all, I want to say we are a zoo. There was a, a commercial they had on there uh, a number of years ago uh, with an African guy in our African village, and he, he was basically saying, we're not the zoo, like it was an African word or something. And so everyone at the zoo was like, what? We are a zoo. So I just want to talk about zoos for a second. So we're a member of the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And there's about 211 of those zoos uh, accredited across North America, and that's in Canada and the States. And just as a, a fact, we see over 142 million visitors annually, and that's more than all major sporting events combined across the United States and Canada. So that just tells you the impact that zoos have. So I think it, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, do you think it's good to have animals in captivity and all this? And, you know, I'd say 99% of the animals we have now were born into captivity. That's what they know. I would rather see an elephant in the wild. But I will say... Um, their impact probably on people and as ambassadors for their species is massive. So I think those animals you know, um, can take a little bit of sacrifice just like we all can um, to kind of support their species. So I think that's probably the role they fulfill. So at Disney, our mission is threefold. Uh, we talk about conservation, education, and research. And a lot of zoos talk about this, but I'm very proud to work at a place that actually does it. And they actually do it, and we talk the talk, and we walk the walk. And the first thing you know, I'm going to talk about is a Disney Wildlife, uh, sorry, Worldwide Conservation Fund. And this is a fund that's actually um, mainly brought to Disney from our guests. And we started this, and guests can donate a dollar when they're buying something at one of the parks, and it goes to this fund. And then every year, we have a, um, basically a granting process for uh, conservation organizations. And people can get up to $20,000 for a grant per year. And we do about 50 of these projects a year around the world on all the continents. And it's not just on animals. It's plant conservation and environmental stuff. And as well, every one of these things has to have some type of educational component to it uh, for the people where they're doing it. So you can't just go in and you know, count how many lemmings are there and then leave. You need to go in and actually do something about it and you know, make sure that people understand what you're doing. And, and so it works really well. So I'm very proud of that. And as well, um, so we're not competing against that. They give us, uh, there's money at Animal Kingdom for people, cast members, and we're all cast members because we're all part of the show, um, that they give us money so we're, we can compete for it. You have to put in for and we have an internal granting organization. And this allows us to do some of our research, which I'll talk about later. So I'll talk a bit about our veterinary services department. We're actually probably not one of the largest zoos, um, but we're probably one of the largest zoos based on the amount of staff we have. And we have approximately 10 veterinarians, and so we have a couple of them that um, are pathologists, so we don't really count them. Sorry, Lisa. Uh, <laughs> what we do at 5 o'clock when I go, phew, I don't have to do any necropsies today. Um, so, because that's what most zoo vets do at the end of the day. And then we have a couple guys that manage, and then uh, there's about five of us that do the bulk of the clinical work all, um, every day. And so on a normal day at Animal Kingdom, people always ask me, so what do you do? Well, we normally start about 6 in the morning because it gets pretty warm there quick. And if we have to do hoof stock immobilizations, um, we need to get that done quick. So usually by 6.30, I'm in the field darting something or working on a large animal. And uh, you know, a lot of times in the morning, it's still about 75 um, when we're doing that to start. Um, and they can get heated up pretty quick. And then um, we come back, we kind of round it about nine with everyone in the hospital. And then we do on-show procedures. We do a lot of preventive medicine I'll talk about in a minute. 
And we do this all in show in front, of, uh, in front of all of our guests, and so they can come up and see us doing this. So it takes a lot of people, because every day we have two veterinarians on Animal Kingdom and one veterinarian over at the seas doing fish and marine mammal stuff, and we all kind of rotate around in that. So then to back us up, we have numerous technicians. There's two, uh, three to four techs on every day helping us. We have hospital keepers that just look after the animals in the hospital in our quarantine building. And then we have a really cool, met we're all digital uh, web-based um, computer record system. And then we have interns. And then our animal nutrition center is part of us. And they make the diets for all the animals every day. And there's about 20 people over there. So it's quite a large department. So I'm just going to go through, if you're not familiar, the challenges of zoological medicine. And really, the big one has been and continues to be um, limited information. And this is a lack of normal values. Um, and when I, I, when I mean that, if you're not a vet, um, it means like, you know, if you go to the doctor and they take your blood and they look at your white blood cell count to see if you're sick, they know that, you know, 10,000 in a human is probably all right, and 15 is not getting good, and 20, you're probably pretty sick. But we don't know that in a lot of these animals. And, and some of these an animals, for example, like reptiles and fish, have nucleated red blood cells, so we can't actually use a lot of the automated machines that are made for mammals, so you have to have special training for your technicians. Um, secondly, you know, how do you get a blood sample from a fish? I mean, where do you um, stick that porcupine to get a blood sample? Um, what about this chameleon? Where do you go on him? So it takes a little bit of time to kind of, um, kind of work your way around how to do that. But we have a huge database now, and things are going pretty well. But as you can imagine, the more you're in this field, the more you realize how little we know. I mean, even in dogs and cats and everything, the kind of more you dwell into it, the more you kind of go, wow, we don't really know that much. And for example, on the lower left um, up there, that's a fish, and he's not dead. So he's been anesthetized, and we're going to take an x-ray of him quickly, pull him out of the, um, his anesthetic bath, and take an x-ray of him. Now, that was actually one of the things you should be very proud about at AVC is the fish program here. And uh, when I went into DAC, uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom, we have that large aquarium at Epcot. I could do anything any of the other vets did, and I've done a number of research projects on um, using injectable anesthesia and fish and all be basically because of the training I got here. So you're very lucky you should take advantage of that while you're here. The other thing that's challenging in zoo medicine is balancing individual versus herd health. Um, for example, uh, and, well, and social considerations. And sometimes we don't think about that in dogs and cats, even though we talk about it with some of their owners maybe, but um, for example, the guy on the um, right up there is a mandrel. And mandrels live in uh, complex societies of males and females. It's a large primate. And um, Rafiki on um, at Disney's Animal, or sorry, um, The Lion King, uh, he's actually a mandrel. So mandrels are very interesting in the fact that um, they have a hierarchy, just like many primates. And if we go in there um, one day and say, take out number two guy, because it's his annual exam, bring him to the hospital and do all this stuff to him, there's probably going to be a, a shift in the power at the building. And then we take him back, he's probably going to get his butt kicked, because number three is bumped up into number two, and so on, and so on, and so on. Or if he's injured, and this is a thing that's sometimes hard, hard to, to kind of battle as a zoo vet, he could get into a pretty good fight, maybe lose the end of one of his fingers, get a good bite on his arm. I mean, we might decide not to do anything about it. Because if I go in there and take him out and treat him and do all this stuff to him, and he comes back with sutures and smelling all weird, he's probably going to get his butt kicked. So we might say, OK, we can't do that to that guy today. But what we have done is we have a department called Behavioral Husbandry, and they've trained many of our animals to actually do, uh, do behaviors that are normal to the animal that can help us. So for example, the mandrels and the gorillas, we can ask them to come up to the bars in their holding area, and open their mouth, show me their shoulder, show me their back, let me touch their stomach. And actually our gorillas, in uh, male gorillas, uh, they have heart and cardiac diseases just like humans do. And we've trained all of our gorillas, we have about 14 gorillas, to actually do passive cardiac ultrasounds now. So they come up to the bars and hold on to the bars and they place their chest on an open spot in the bars. And we have a human a cardiology technician do the echocardiogram on them so we can follow their heart issues. And so that's all because of our behavioral husbandry. So the other interesting thing is too, if we have to immobilize them, they're trained to come up to the bar and take a needle in the arm. So instead of me going in there with a gun, a dart gun to dart these guys, 
they can get the, uh, one of the keepers will call them up like a practice regime, except they just get stuck and they kind of go, oh, what did you do? You actually stuck me. Um, but by the time they realize what's going on, it's too late. Because if you go in there sometimes with a gun, you might get scattered uh, with some other stuff that's lying around in the enclosure <laughs> that they might throw at you. And that's why monkeys are evil. So the other thing is social considerations. Here we see a beautiful flamingo, and everyone likes flamingos, but I have a rule. And the rule is most things with long legs and long necks are not very smart. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> so, so this flamingo's got a foot injury, and you can see his little foot's bandaged there. So we pull him off show where he's out there with his 50 buddies on the island. And uh, we have three or four flocks of flamingos, actually. And we bring him into the hospital. and. He is not going to eat for us because he's not too worried about the bandage because I don't think he really knows there's a bandage there. Um, and secondly, he's used to eating around a bunch of his friends. So he's like, I'm not eating. Where's everyone? Where's everyone? I'm sure that's all that's going through his mind a hundred times. <laughs> they make Irish shutters look smart. Um, so, so what we do is, we got the brainiac idea, get a bunch of um, dressing mirrors and hang them in there. So we put the dressing mirrors in the corner where his food bowl is, and he walks over to the food bowl and goes, hey, everyone's here. And then he'll start eating. <laughs> so, or, and so occasionally we have to get a buddy and they really think there's a lot going on there, because you see them doing their weird head thing and all the, so their eyes dilating and everything. So sometimes you have to think about that um, as an option. Okay, so what's the rule? Long necks, long legs, not very smart. <laughs> so here we go with some of our giraffe. Now, giraffe are actually really cool. We do a lot with our giraffe, but this is a prime example of opera conditioning. So you got to move a giraffe from one place to the other. How do you do it? Well, we have a trailer. So, but how do you get them in that trailer? Well, they're tough to move around if, you, if they don't want to. So we actually, through opera conditioning, have trained them to target, and you can see to this like uh, pool boy, and he'll come up and target it, and they get rewarded um, both with a little food, and then they do a clicker training. And so the animal bridges, and a lot of times you actually don't have to feed them, they'll just do it. So he knows we can actually get them into a large chute. They can come in, I can take blood from them, do a physical exam. If they have parasites, I can give them a levamisol bolus in the mouth, um, that kind of thing. And so, you know, if we want to move some from, let's say, the animal king, or one savanna to another savanna or over at the lodge, or we have to actually, we breed them, so we send out a lot of babies, we have to train them to get in the trailer. So they back the trailer up to the barn and slowly train them over a number of days to get in the trailer. Finally, they get in the trailer, shut the door, hold them for 15 minutes, let them go. So it's not negative, a negative thing. And then one day, you finally just shut them and shut the back and drive them down the road, and they're like, whatever. So, but... <laughs> Here you can see, I don't know if you've been to Animal Kingdom, we have a large safari ride of about 50 acres, and all the animals are out there mixed all day. But at 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock when we close, um, they know it's time to come in. So they all kind of start piling up at the gate. And we have a different queue for each species of animal. So there might be a bicorn for the Tommy gazelle. So everyone stands there. It's a quite amazing. And then the Tommies go in, and they go off into their stall. And then we do the giraffe. So a number of years ago, um, they... We're filing everyone in, and they're ringing the cowbell for the giraffe, and nothing, nothing, nothing. And this is kind of the view you get from our barn. And uh, Keeper's like, what's going on? Something's going on. So Keeper walks all the way down the corridor and pokes his head around the corner. Well, another long-legged, long-necked thing called an ostrich <laughs> laid an egg in the middle of the path, <laughs> which could have been a lion. And uh, 15 giraffe are piled up there staring at the egg. <laughs> And they're like, something's wrong. We're not crossing that. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> so the keeper had to walk out there, get the egg, go around the corner, wait 15 minutes, and then ring the cowbell. And then they all start coming back, and they all proceed to jump over the spot where the egg was. Because <laughs> they didn't know if there was a landmine or what was going on. So, uh, and we never got the ostrich in either. So um, the ostrich would never come in. So that's giraffe. We're also able to train a lot of uh, things that you might not think you could train. For example, rhinos. Um, white rhinos, there's white rhinos and black rhinos are two of the four species, and we, and we have these two species. And um, so we want to follow them. Some of them have different disease problems that we want to follow. Um, 
and like some of them store iron, especially the black rhinos are a bit iffy on some of their medicine. So we like to do routine blood draws. So they're actually trained to come up to the bars, they'll stand there, and we can actually stick, do a leg stick and collect blood on them whenever they want, and they will stand there and do that. So this other guy over here, his name's Travis, he's a black rhino, and black rhinos are notoriously, um, notoriously a little bit edgy. They kind of live on the knife's edge. And they're smaller, white rhinos are more like cattle. Um, so he, he was having some horn issues and we actually figured out that he had a, he cracked his horn and had an infection in his horn. And so we wanted to take x-rays, so we didn't really want to have to go to a full immobilization, which we could if we wanted to, but we decided, oh, let's see if BH can train him, uh, the keepers, to stick his head through the door, hold it there while the techs bring a bunch of x-ray stuff and x-ray his head. And within five days, they had trained him to come in there and uh, hold his head through the door. And here you can see the techs taking x-ray and we we're able to diagnose that. And then we were able to slowly, you can see his horn is a little bit larger here, uh, cut away at his horn to get down to that soft spot, kind of pair it out. And that horn is continually growing. So his horn looks like this again. That was a couple years ago. Um, so that was really good because black rhino um, are very kind of they're not trusting. What's the rule? <laughs> so look at this guy. He's probably been on that thing a thousand times and he's still looking at it like it's going to turn into a crocodile. <laughs> so we've even done this with our birds. Now you say, why would you want to train a bird to do that? Well, this guy's out living on the savanna. How much do we know? How, how much does he weigh? You know, he comes in and also if we just throw food out there, there's wild vultures, we have ibis, we have all kinds of stuff, maybe they're stealing his food. So um, with these guys and the marabou storks and things like that, they will come in and station and it looks like a little kindergarten room with different colored mats and they know they go to the blue one, the orange one, and they'll stand there and then they can actually toss in their food individually or they can put a scale under. So he's used to the mat, but he's not used to the mat maybe being up a couple inches, so he's giving it the good eyeball. And yes, you can even do reptiles. Actually, reptiles are some of the easiest guys to train. Um, especially, this is a Komodo dragon here, and they're very, very smart. They're probably similar to a cat in their intelligence. And you can literally train a Komodo dragon to target in about a, a day. And so this guy sees this thing, he'll come and hold his nose right against it, and then he gets a little reward. So he can come up here, um, actually onto this scale. He'll come into this box. Now this box is kind of cool. It's connected to his enclosure, and we have a new one now that's all kind of plexiglass. And what'll happen is if we want to do something with him or have him come up for his annual exam, we'll target him into the box and then we just shut the back of the box and he's in this box and we bring the whole box up to the hospital and we have doors in there. I can reach and ultrasound him. We can uh, take his tail out to do a blood stick. And it's very interesting because you we can do x-rays through that, but then we take him back and let him out, and you think he'd be freaked out by it, you can target him right back in there and he'll go right back in two minutes later. So obviously, he's used to doing that, it's not that big of a deal for him. But if I went in there and grabbed him and stuffed him in a thing and took him up, I mean, you know, it would not be a good thing, probably because I couldn't even hold on. This guy's about eight feet long. So, now little guys, why would you want to do this with a little poison arrow frog? That guy's about two grams. Well, how do you safely grab one of those without crushing them? And, um, so we can actually, these guys are trained to come into this little clicker, they use a clicker, they'll jump out, jump into this box, we can actually weigh them, we can x-ray them through that. We've had some issues with hypovitaminosis A in these guys and they have some bone issues along with that. So we can do that and then let them go and the, no worse for the wear. Our other group that's very successful is crocodiles. We have 28 adult Nile male crocodiles that are about 14 feet and they weigh about 500 kilos. And these guys are all trained to come into this box. And um, actually, it's very interesting when we bang on they have a they have a cue. We actually bang on the door of this, and they kind of know what's going on. There's a pile up at the gate to get into the box, because they get rewarded. But when they come in there, we weigh them. We can um, take blood from their tail. We do a lot of nutritional studies on these guys. And you know, then sometimes they'll just sit there. And uh, they don't want to leave the box. So um, I'm not the most patient person. I'm always like, get a stick. Let me poke him. He'll get out of there. No, 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 no. No negative reinforcement. No negative reinforcement. You know, the behavior people. And uh, I'm like, it's a crocodile. He doesn't care. He doesn't know. Um, so anyways, uh, then I just leave. I, I've had it. So um, it's very interesting because we've had some that have, we had one actually get his foot tore off by one of his buddies. And um, the keepers noticed it within a day, and we had him in the box by that afternoon. 
We were able to take x-rays. I actually was able to grab it and look at it because he just sat there in the box. And we were able to administer antibiotics and, um, and analgesics actually too. Um, and so we were able to treat him and he'd come into the box every day for his antibiotics. So it was really cool. So this is a big list um, on the left-hand side of the screen. And uh, unlike some zoos, we are very big into doing routine preventative medicine. So all our animals are actually seen annually or every other year, depending on their species. And, and we have a bunch of uh, standard operating guidelines. But we also do a lot of pre-ship exams and a lot of quarantine. And actually, one of my contact areas is pre-ship and quarantine. And it was actually, it's actually a very daunting area because you have to look at all the animals that are coming in and out, all the records, and ask for you know, the tests you want. So you instantly become very good at all those tests like um, the parasitologists talk about and the virologists talk about. You forget about all those weird viral diseases because I have to remember them because they, we could bring it into our collection. Um, so this is just a list on the one side. So for an annual exam on one of these kudus here, we might do all this. We might only get our hands on them once a year. So we go through, we take a bunch of blood, we do all kinds of serologies, we test them all for all kinds of diseases, um, we vaccinate them for all kinds of things. And we actually do a lot of vaccine titers now and stuff, uh, like our large cats, um, so we don't have to hopefully vaccinate them as much, and as well as some of our hoof stock, um, we do that as well. Now, some of those tighter levels we've arbitrarily assigned where we think is safe. We usually go way safer than the requirements for domestic animals. So doing that, we might do a lot of prophylactic things. Um, for example, like hoof, hoof issues. Uh, we have a lot of hoof issues. And the reason is we're in Florida. And what is Florida made of? Sand. There is not a rock in Florida. If you want to have a rock in Florida, it has to be shipped in. So if you go to Africa and see where most of these hoofstock are, the ground is like this with some dirt sprinkled around on it. So um, they're used to very hard situations. So we have soft, wet conditions, which means lots of foot issues. We also have um, issues with um, ruminitis and some of our large uh, browsing species that end up eating a lot of grass and then that ends up in founder issue and white line disease. So over the last couple of years, I've had to get very good at um, diagnosing that. Now sometimes, as you can see here, we've actually gotten a professional farrier to come in and help us with our zebras when we have really bad cases. They might put different hoof uh, protectors or you know, help us get through those procedures. The other thing we do is we might have to do specialty things. We have all the scopes. We have all the equipment you could ever want, but like um, doing stomach biopsies on this snake um, or doing, for example, this line getting some dental work. Like we'll do routine dental work, but we actually have a, a board certified veterinary dentist in Tampa Bay called Mike Peak, and he comes over and helps us. Like this guy's had a root canal, I can tell you. Um, they end up over years. This guy's about 10 years old, end up fracturing off one of his canines. And, um, we could do the root canal, but if we have Mike come in, he can do it in about 10 minutes. I can concentrate on the anesthesia, and we get done that much quicker. Plus, then, if the root canal doesn't work, I can call up Mike and go, Mike, the root canal didn't work. Get back here. And I've never had to do that, but it's much easier than looking and go, oh, I screwed up again. So um, you have to, and that, that's one thing I think you have to know. Even if you're boarded, even if you've had 100 years' experience, you need to, there's going to be times when you need to know that you need help. You always can go to someone else and ask them, get other help to help you do something, and that's how you learn, and that's what makes you a better veterinarian. You have to be able to know when you've got to say, uh, I'm not sure. And um, I've had people say that to me a number of times, uh, some husbandry guys, because they'll ask me a question, and I'll be like, well, I don't know, and they kind of go, what do you mean you don't know? I'm like, I've never heard a vet say that. So that, that's something we should say more often, but what you need to do is say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. And then you need to go find out, because you can't know everything. You can't even know a, a sliver of everything. So it's very important to be a little bit humble when you're doing your job. It'll, it'll work you miles with the people you work with. So um, that's a fairly large boa there. Um, but he's asleep, so that's good. Um, but we do a lot of education. And how we do that is we actually have a veterinary show window. And if you come to Animal Kingdom, and you take the train in Africa up to Conservation Station. We actually have um, a Conservation Station. There's a petting zoo. There's a bunch of educational stuff for kids. Um, we have a lot of reptiles up there. But um, this window here, you can see um, behind Dr. Mark here. This is my big boss at Disney. Uh, we're doing a laparoscopic procedure on this big female green sea turtle. She's a big one, though, eh? like 580 pounds, I think. Um, so these are all guests out in the park watching us do. 
our job. So every day from about 9 to 12, we bring all, most of our patients in. At least one of us will be on show doing procedures. We'll even do um, you know, things like surgery and that kind of stuff. And actually, I've got, I was telling the students, I said I have a couple of funny stories about that. So when, when we do surgery, we usually tell people, look, there's going to be blood or there's going to be maybe something pussy. You might not like to see this you know, nasty stuff. And, uh, but before we didn't do that, and we go ahead and do surgery, and occasionally you hear, bonk, as someone passed out and hit that glass. <laughs> and we used to keep a score chart, but we never talked about it. Um, and actually, this case, this kangaroo here, all these people here, um, Disney does a lot of promotional stuff. This is actually our lab, so our techs are on show, so we make them smile. Yes, we make our techs smile. And um, <laughs> they'd kill me if they heard that, but they're not here. So, um, so they can see the techs, and they can actually see into our radiology room, too. So we had this kangaroo, and he had, um, kangaroos can get some mouth issues, and they can get lumpy jaw and stuff. So I was working on this guy's tooth and pulled out a tooth that had a bunch of, like, junk buildup on it. And they were filming for Disney Vacation Club, and all these people uh, were supposed to be guests, but they were actually actors and actresses. So they were the beautiful people. And they're all, like, pretending they're looking onto this, and they're kind of filming this thing. Well, one of the ladies in there, when she saw me pull that tooth out, and it wasn't even that bad, and I didn't even think they could really get a good view, actually started throwing up in there. <laughs> like, she just kind of went, Whoa, and then, like, ran to the side. And I didn't know about it after, but, like, everyone was smiling in the back. I'm like, what's going on back here? You made the actors puke. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Not our guests, just the actors. They were employees. So we do that every day. It's actually quite cool. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, I'll get on the microphone, and I'll talk to the guests, say, here, this is what we're going to do today, blah, blah, blah. And um, then we'll go start doing it. We also have people that stand on the other side of the glass that are more or less in tune to know what's going on. They're cast members. They'll start talking about what's going on to the guests. And at the end of the procedure, I usually come back, and we talk to the guests again. But it's really good, because I think it showcases what we all do as vets. You'd be surprised these people go, you can do a dental on an on a, on a animal? You can do a... Ultrasound, they have, like, lots of people have no clue. And we get some people to come back year after year the same week, and they'll sit in front of that window every day and watch us. It's just unbelievable. So, um, so it's very cool. I really enjoy that part of the job. So this is one thing at Disney. If you're not kind of extroverted, you have to train yourself to be extroverted because you have to be on show. You need to talk to people, and it's, um, it's part of our job to actually do that. So, um, and as you can imagine, in our vet team of 10 people, I think me and my boss there, Mark, are the only true extroverted people, and everyone else is kind of introverted. Uh, but if you heard them now on show, you wouldn't be able to tell. They're all very good at this. Uh, it's, um, it's actually a very, a very good way to communicate with people and, uh, and learn more about yourself as well. So the elephant's sleeping. That's water over the elephant's back there. Um, so I'm going to talk about now some of the field uh, conservation and research we do. And this is a, a really lucky part of my job. I get to travel to Africa quite a bit, um, usually once a year at least, and do some work on different species. And people always say, um, oh, you're so lucky to do that. And I am. I've been very lucky. But I think, you know, I was telling the students today, a definition of luck for me is uh, luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. And so... You know, you can look at this and go, that's so cool, I wish I could do that. But unless you do something about it, you're never going to get there. So you have to be prepared. You have to go do the things, whether it's this, or if you want to be a small animal surgeon, or you just want to go into general practice in your community and own your own practice. You have to study that. You have to prepare for that. And then when the opportunity comes, you, you know, you're going to be ready for it. So, um, so yes, but I am still very lucky. And uh, one of the first projects I ever went on uh, was a Guam Rail reintroduction. So not everything is always big, mega, charismatic stuff. And that's fine with me. I actually like the poor, maligned animals, like reptiles and things like that more. But I've been very lucky to work with the large stuff. So Guam rails are a small, flightless bird. Here you can see them up in the corner. They're only about this big. And they're from, um, they're actually in the crane family. So, but they're flightless, and they live on islands in the South Pacific. And this particular species lives, used to live on the island of Guam. So I'm sure some of you maybe have, who's heard of the island of Guam in here? Oh, you gotta love Canada, eh? Everyone knows. Um, it's nice. Um, sorry. And um, so Guam's way out, I mean, it's a bear of a flight to get there. It's about 20 hours. So it's way out in the middle of the Pacific. And well, what ended up happening during World War II, 
Um, the Japanese had kind of invaded there, and then the Americans came back in and pushed them out. And then they kind of used that island as the theater operations for um, taking back the rest of the Marianas and, you know, all the Iwo Jimas, and that's where John Wayne was and everyone. So, um, but during that time, these birds were on there, and this thing got introduced. Does anyone know the name of this? It's called the brown tree snake, and it's from somewhere else in the Philippines. It's a venomous snake, uh, but it's just very mildly venomous. It only has um, rear fangs. Um, so if it bit you, you know, you might get like a reaction at the site, but not much more. But these, these snakes came in and all that traffic, air traffic that was coming into Guam during that time, and they got released on the island, and they basically multiplied. They had no predator, and they'd eaten every bird on the island. I mean, there's no... It's eerily quiet there. There are no birds on this island. And so it ate all the rails, all the babies. The, the adults were too big. And then what the, the adults, uh, what the snakes didn't eat, the babies, the adults were left. Feral cats took out the rest. So because there's a lot of people there. There's actually a huge American military base of about 15,000 people there still. So what's happened is they actually have about 100 of these guys left, and they're sitting in these enclosures on Guam in this heavily fortified compound um, to keep out the brown tree snake. And they breed them in zoos in North America. And we're actually releasing them on a other island. You can see just off the coast of Guam called Rhoda. And there's no uh, brown tree snakes over there, and there's only minimal people. And so there's some feral cats, but they, I hate to say it, they have a um, bounty out for cats on this island. Um, so if people see cats, they kind of tend to do away with them, the feral ones at least. So what's happened is they've taken these birds, we've, they breed them at this facility in zoos in North America, we send them back over, and then they've released about 200 of them into the wild. And here you can see in the bottom corner there, uh, me with some of the other vets I work with, Scott Terrell, he's actually one of our pathologists. Because um, what we did is we were releasing these birds on the island, but there's lots of people that have chickens there. And so if anything was going to get in contact, these birds were going to get in contact with chickens. So we're like, well, what, what kind of diseases do those chickens have? And we can only imagine. So we took our pathologist with us, and we bled all these chickens and went around to all these guys' places and bled them. And actually, the chickens were clean. They were beautiful. So we knew we were probably OK you know, um, from that kind of uh, disease standpoint. And then what's one of our other vets, Deidre Fontenot, one of our hospital keepers. So we went over there and um, did a pre-shipment, ex pre-health exam on all these birds and tested them for mycobacteriosis and a bunch of other diseases before they were actually released. And there we were releasing them. And they've released about 200 over the last five or six years. And based on the biologist's work there, they think there's about 500 now. So they brought those birds back from extinction, really. Um, and this is probably one of the one of the few reintroductions that have actually taken place. And so, so I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of that. It's very interesting. Here you can see me with the guys from Guam actually uh, taking blood on one of them. So one of the other projects I've been lucky to work with is um, hyenas, another maligned animal. So the best way to get to hyenas is to go out at night because you don't really see them in the day. So we go out at night um, to get these guys and immobilize them. And the reason we we're trying to do it is uh, they currently have drugs that work to immobilize them. But if you work on them for half an hour or so, the drugs still last for probably a couple hours. So you take this animal and you lay it down, and he's lying there by himself in Africa. Um, and this is a Kruger National Park where I've done this work. And so what potentially happens to him? Well, something comes along and kills him. Um, because everything is out for everything. Even his buddies might turn on him, you know, that whole social order thing. They might take him out because he's, you know, there's something wrong with him, he's weak, whatever. So I've developed an injectable anesthesia um, that we actually give an injection that has a couple drugs in it called uh, metatomidine, uh, butorphan, almodazolam. And all these drugs have a reversal, so I can give another drug to them after, and it takes away the effects of the first drug. So we can keep the animal down, and then when we're done, we give them the injection, they basically pop up and they can run off. So we wanted to test this on hyena. So here you can see us at night. We had a film crew with us one night. This is Jacques here with his, his camera. And it looks pretty black out there, but if you look really closely, you can see one hyena here, hyena, 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 hyena. I know these are only the ones looking at us. So, um, <laughs> And then, this is kind of blurry, but I had a night vision scope, so I kind of took my camera up and started going around like this. And you can see how close. They're like, you know, maybe 40, 50 feet away from us. 
these guys are used to seeing people, so it wasn't that bad. But um, usually how we, um, what we were doing is, because if we went out to dart one of these guys at night and you get your dart gun out, yeah, you could see him and spotlight him and then dart him, and he would run off into the woods. Well, what are you going to do? You, well, you could chase him. It's almost impossible in a day to follow them. He could maybe go a mile or two. Um, plus, if you're on foot in there by yourself at night running around with flashlights, there's lots of other things out there. Um, <laughs> like everything out there <laughs> will kill you. Um, so what we decided to do, well, maybe this wasn't the best idea, even though it sounded exciting. We tried it a couple nights. Um, we actually ended up putting out some really big traps. And um, oh, here you can see one. Um, they're like a big giant have a heart trap um, with a piece of meat in it. When a uh, hyena would go in, they'd pull on it, get stuck in there. And we knew kind of where their den area was. So we put out five or six of these at about 5 p.m. Then we go have dinner, and about 8 o'clock, we'd go out and look to see if we caught anyone. And then we'd start working on them. So we'd pull it up and uh, dart them in the crate there and then bring them out. And what we would do then is to make sure our drugs are working well is we hook them up to a bunch of different machines that tell us how much oxygen they're taking in and out of their body, how much CO2 they're blowing out. We take blood samples to look for disease, and we take other blood samples to see how much oxygen's in their blood. And we do blood pressures and whatnot. And here you can see us doing this on the back of a pickup truck here. And this was actually a little guy, which was kind of nice. We caught, we caught the whole clan in, in this area. And um, so it worked very well. We did about 25 animals. So, and one of the last days, they called us and said, hey, there's a hyena about 20 miles away that um, we, has got an injury to its neck. We'd like you to see if you could catch it. Well, they knew this animal was around there. And then one morning, one of the game guards saw him run into a culvert under the hot, like this road's going through Kruger. And sometimes they hang out in the day in there instead of a den. So they said he's just starting to lose body condition. So that means he's just starting to get a little bit skinny. So he's probably in trouble. Now, normally, these guys at a place like Kruger Park don't act on wildlife things. So if they saw a kudu with a broken leg, they leave it alone, because that's nature. But because this is man-made issue, uh, they like to deal with it, because you know, this is an unnatural event for this animal to die from a snare that's set you know, by poachers at the edge of the park to try and get uh, maybe an antelope or something. So we went down there, and um, the guy had already blocked the end of both the, uh, the culverts off, so he was in there. So we darted him in the culvert. And um, I, I was telling the students this earlier, but I forgot to mention. So he's in this culvert, and I didn't put the picture in here, but um, he's in this culvert, and I darted him, but I think I got a partial shot. Like, it maybe went a little bit sub q So when you dart them, you want the dart to go in the muscle, and the drug goes in the muscle, and then it gets absorbed by all the blood. Well, if it kind of goes just this side of the muscle, it doesn't get as absorbed very fast. So he was kind of awake, but he was in the middle. So he sent the intern in with a stick. <laughs> And uh, we're like, get this piece of rope on him and so we can drag him out. OK. And this South African guy, that in he goes. So um, that was good. Um, <laughs> he didn't get hurt. It was, my combination was beautiful, though. He was almost asleep by the time they had him out. So he eventually went to sleep as soon as we got him out. And here you can see his injury. You could see this red around his neck. And when I went to intubate him, and what that means is I put a tube into his windpipe because we want to monitor how much air is going in and out of him. I hit something, and then I looked real closely, and the wire had actually tightened down and slowly was going through his neck, and, but he was healing behind it. It was going so slow. And this piece of wire was actually halfway through his neck and going right in front of his windpipe or his trachea. I could see it. And I'm like, ooh. And I just was like, I can't believe this animal's still running around. He also had one on his paw that was pretty bad. So what we did is I snipped it on the one side, we pulled it out, we cleaned up the wound, and actually we were doing um, some other research on the hyenas at that time with respect to something called myco, um, ba uh, mycobacterium, which is a tuberculosis, because they have a problem in the park there uh, with their buffalo, and a lot of the um, lions are actually dying of TB. And the hyenas never have it, so these guys were doing research on that, so we actually did the skin tests in them, but then they actually took a bunch of blood and did some other, other stuff um, to them. So we actually took them back, held them for three days in a holding facility, and we actually held, uh, did re-looked at his wounds and gave him antibiotics and fixed him up a bit more. And about a week later, he, he looked like he was 100%. We gave him all the food he could eat, and after about a day, he's like, hey, this is great. You know, he'd be waiting for, to get some warthog or something. So um, and about a week later, we took him, immobilized him again, and took him back and released him with his pack, and uh, he was fine. So that was a really, a really cool story. So we were also able, um, uh, a couple nights, to do some lions. So 
I, I didn't notice this till later, but if you look here, what's that say? AVC, Atlantic Veterinary College. So, yay. So, um, so to catch, there's a couple ways to do lions. Well, we actually ended up catching some lions in some of our traps set for hyenas. We had one about, I was telling the students this afternoon, a trap that was about as big as a room, but it was only about this high, and it had one big door on it, and then we would wire some meat to this middle post, and if the hyenas came in and pulled that, we hoped to catch a bunch of them, this door would shut. Well, we're doing the hyena one night, and someone says, hey, we caught a lion in the big trap over there. So we said, oh, yeah. I said, let's do it, let's do them. So uh, we go over to do them. I'm in the back of the truck uh, with one of the other vets from uh, South Africa, Marcus Hoffmeyer, and that's, I, uh, all this research I do over there, I kind of do in conjunction with him. So we're standing in the back of this pickup truck, and we pull up to this thing, it's pitch black, and there was another guy standing in the back with us with a rifle. And he was saying, okay, you know, I was gonna hold the flashlight, he had the gun, and Marcus was gonna dart the lion. And it wasn't until that moment um, when we pulled up and we were beside it, and the fence was about here, like this, and I'm standing here like this looking at the lion about 30 feet away, and he's chowing down on this uh, warthog, um, and you could hear him going, kuh, kuh, kuh. and I just realized, you know, he could jump up here, you know, um, and for just, I don't know why I didn't think of it earlier, so um, the guy with the gun, his name's Hoople, he said, keep the light on the animal, because if you, like, freak out and do this, I can't shoot the dark, you know, so I said, okay, I understand, he goes, the second Marcus starts him, shut the light off, I said, okay. So I had the light on, Marcus goes, okay, on the count three, one, two, three, Poof, hits him, and I, heard, I shut the light off, and you just hear, and this thing's banging off the cage, and we're standing there, uh, probably not the smartest thing, and your heart's going, it's a good adrenaline rush, um, and then it stopped, and we're sitting there, and then I hear Hoople go, turn, turn the light on, and I was imagining just turning the light on, seeing the lion sitting beside us, um, <laughs> but lucky, he was uh, out, and another victory for anesthesia, um, <laughs> And we're all like, yeah, that went smooth. I'm like, he could have jumped in here. And they're like, yeah, that's why we have the gun. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyways, you can see how big these guys are. That, that's uh, not a little kid's hand. That's my hand. So that's a, a pretty big line there. And here you can see another female here. But how they catch uh, lines to do, we had to catch some a number of nights um, to replace their collars because each, each um Troop of lions, um, one of them is collared in all of Kruger because they're studying this TB. So how you catch a lion, this is how you do it. First of all, um, they get, find a tree, and then they have this wire, um, this, like, it looks like a bike rack. They have two of them, they put them behind the tree, and they get a bunch of acacia thorns and pile it up behind here. And then unfortunately, um, we go out and shoot a zebra. <laughs> um, I'm like, where are we going to get the bait? And he goes, that one right there. Pow. And it, I mean, it's Africa. So... Um, then they drag the zebra around for a while to get its scent going. Um, and this is a little graphic, so I'm, I'm sorry, but it's nature. Um, and so then they chain the zebra to the base of this tree. And then they have a, a stereo speaker that they put out, and they actually have uh, the sound of a, um, a buffalo calf um, being tormented. And it's going like this and so they're playing this thing and so what you do is you set this all up and then you go have a barbecue about 50 yards away and they have all the cars set up like this and you're just sitting there and everyone's barbecuing and they call it brying um, they, they, let's go for a bry so everyone's sitting there barbecuing and someone goes oh I think I hear something and then you go look around the edge of the car and there's like 10 lions there eating on that zebra and the reason they chain it to that tree because if they didn't the lions would grab the zebra and take off because they're too close to the people so um, then what you do is, then we go, okay, get the dart guns, and they start picking them off one at a time. And, you know, faster animals, overnight, yada, yada. Well, these things would sometimes, half the zebra was gone in 20 minutes. And so, you know, these guys had these huge stomachs, and we didn't have any issues with them. But it worked very well, um, and we used the same combination in the lions. Now, another species I've worked with are wild dogs. And... Um, they're actually a canid, but it's, um, they're called African wild dogs. Um, Lycanos pictus is their scientific name. And here you can see a really beautiful one. This guy had tons of white on him. Um, and they're uh, one of the most endangered carnivores in Africa. There's about 5,000 of them left in all of Africa. And they're kind of like wolves. They live in packs, and they're highly persecuted by people because they'll come around if there's no game and take out like lots of goats or cattle or whatever you have. So. Um, just like the hyena, they were having some troubles with some of their anesthesia. And these guys are a little trickier to anesthetize than just a hyena. 
In the past, they maybe used telazole or, or other combinations with fentanyl has been um, used in them and telazole. But so we use the same kind of reversible combination on these guys. And um, here you can see I'm with one of the South African guys, uh, JJ, and he basically darts animals every day. So he's about to dart this dog here. And then um, once he darts them, um, the dog will run around for a few minutes. And his other buddies are there, so he usually gets a little bit of excitement for a minute. And then he goes down, and the other dogs walk off. So um, what happened then is you kind of have to go up and get this dog. So the first day we were doing it, we had a dose. But you're guesstimating on how much that animal weighs. Because you're looking way over there. Ah, he weighs 40 pounds. OK, dose him this much. So if you're off by 10 pounds, you know, that's quite a bit. You know, the anesthesia might be light, or you could actually be too heavy. So um, JJ and me and this girl here named Juliet, she's one of the rangers at the area, walk out to get this first dog. The other dogs kind of pulled off into the distance. Um, and as JJ picked this dog up, he covered its eyes and he scruffed it. And he got it up to about here. And the dog kind of roused out of it and went Rawr! and kind of turned on him a bit and made some noise, um, which wasn't that bad. We were all like, oh, damn, you know, we're probably going to have to give it more next time. Well, what happened? The other 14 dogs came running back. And this is one of the few times I've been really scared. You don't realize it till after, luckily. Um, but as it's happened, they just came all around us. And, and I was telling the students earlier, now I know what it feels like to be a, like an Impala or something. Because it didn't matter where you turned, they were all there. And they're all going, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was just, it, it was very intense. And we started retreating slowly like this to the truck. And finally, I just said, JJ, because this thing's going, ah, ah, it started really getting noise. So I said, you know, get rid of the dog. So he threw it down, and they all kind of ran to it. Um, and we kind of slowly backed up to this big truck and then crawled back up on the truck. And, uh, um, you know, your heart's beating. It was a pretty good rush. Um, but then I looked at JJ, and if you've been to South Africa, I don't know how to put this, the South African men are very macho, and they rarely say, well, that scared me or whatever. And I kind of looked at JJ, and I'm like, Dude, man, that was intense, you know? And he goes, yeah, I think I have to go change my pants. And I was like, I, I said, yeah, me too. Let's go back to the thing, eh? Um, yeah, and he goes, we might want to. I'm like, yes, I know. Up the dart, dart dose next time we will. So um, we went up a little bit. But I, as an anesthesia, I really like doing anesthesia. Um, but in wildlife stuff, I like to keep them a little light um, when you, because you're doing minor procedures, not like major surgery. And so um, I like them a little on the light side anyways, which sometimes scares people. But OK, now I'm going to talk about doing some elephant work. And this wasn't so much a research project as it was a conservation project. By the head vet uh, for South African National Parks, who I actually met as a veterinary student. We were both students. And a number of years later, I'm at Disney, and he's a Kruger. So we started saying, hey, what can we do together? What can we you know, you know, get some projects going? Well, he was contracted with some other South Africans to go up to Malawi, which is about four countries up from South Africa. And it's in the Rift Valley, and there's a very beautiful lake there called Lake Malawi that stretches about 800 miles up the center of the country um, to move some elephant. And what they were going to do is take about 100 to 130 elephant from one national park to a new national park that was just recently fenced off. The elephants have been poached out of there maybe 100 years ago. Um, so we went. Um, I flew in and met them, but the, whole, the guys came from South Africa with all their equipment. Um, and so what we did is we basically would immobilize elephants in the one park, put them in our transport truck, um, drive eight hours, which was only 150 kilometers, and get, let them go at the other park. So basically how we would do that was with, an, uh, with a helicopter. We had the only two helicopters in all of Malawi, interestingly enough, for the project that we brought from South Africa. And here you can see Barney. He's flying the helicopter. And this is a big bull elephant. And so what you do is you kind of fly in. Um, if Well, some days you could see here in the background, there's probably about 60 elephant right up there. And what we would do is say, OK, today we want a family group of about eight or seven or something. So you fly in with the helicopter on the, f on the big herd, and it'll disperse into all the family units. So all the matriarchs with their sister and their, you know, their kids will run off in smaller groups all over. Then the bulls will, if there's a bull around, they'll just take off. And they say, OK, that group there is the one we want. So then you go in with the helicopter. You have the darts prepared. We have a whole bunch of them prepared. And you dart the matriarch first. And so Barney, we're getting close. Here you can see this one. It's a little hard to see. Here's uh, me and someone else running in. I was the ground guy. And 
you dart the matriarch first and then you pull back and because she'll stand there and when she starts feeling a little tired she falls over and then when she goes down no one else goes anywhere because that's you know that's their whole world there it's kind of sad if you think about it because she's going down and they were gonna, they're going to stay stay with her so then you pull you come back with a helicopter and start picking everyone else off um, so they all go asleep. And so the first day we did this, it was great. And in typical kind of South African style, they go, okay, well, so we're going to go out there and dart this stuff. We'll go up in the helicopter. Greg, you go with Kester on the ground and just take care of all the elephants on the ground. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. So they go off. They dart the first group of elephants. And five elephants go down. And it was the first day. And two kind of run off into the distance. And so the helicopter comes back. I could see Mark setting the helicopter. He's like, keep the elephants down because we didn't have radios. And I'm like, how? Because he didn't give me any drugs or anything. And so he goes, oh. And the drug we use is something called M99. And it's, um, if you've ever, most of us have heard of morphine, OK? That's a real potent pain med they use in people. This is 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So there's 10 milligrams in one mil, so like a sugar cube size of drug. And that's enough to knock down one of these bull elephants. So if you stick yourself with that, you're going down. So, <laughs> We always draw up all the drugs um, with masks and gloves on, because even if you sprayed that up in your face, you'd probably be in trouble if it got into your eyes or to your mouth. So Marcus proceeds to throw me the ball of M99 out of the helicopter, <laughs> and one 1cc syringe, and says, Whoosh! and you just hear, Rrr! I always remember that sound, Rrr! as the helicopter is fading away. So, I was left on the ground at this point uh, with five elephants immobilized, and these two guys here, um, which were kind of helpful. Um, <laughs> it was good. This guy was from South Africa, so he could speak some English, so that was cool. And um, this guy was from Malawi, and he could speak English too. So we started going over, well, I was panicking in my mind <laughs> because if we immobilize an elephant at Disney, we would probably have this many people there. You know, I'd have six fats, you two people be doing anesthesia, you're doing this, you're doing this. And I'm standing there with nothing, no oxygen. No, well, I actually had a pulse oximeter and a capnograph with me, just out of my own interest. Um, but in South Africa, their anesthetic monitoring on an elephant is basically they get a stick about this big, and they break it off. And you go to the end of the trunk, and you open the trunk, and you jam it in there to keep the end of the trunk open. So they don't go <laughs> like that. Um, so that's basically what they do. Uh, we used to kid, I'm like, the South African pulse ox. Um, <laughs> So anyway, so here we are. This is um, after I calmed down after about 20 minutes. And uh, at about 40 minutes, what we started to have to do is start give these guys a little more drugs because they would slowly start waking up. And, um, and you can see the tree line was maybe about a kilometer away in the background. So I started thinking, you know, what's going on? Where are these guys? Because I couldn't even hear the helicopter. And this grass here doesn't look very high, but it was about this high. So the only way you could see anything is a stand-up. This was kind of a small elephant stand on their back, and like you could maybe see over the grass a bit. And um, so we waited and waited and waited. It took them three hours to get back to us. So by the end of that time, I was pretty comfortable with elephant anesthesia. And uh, so we would top these guys up about every 10 minutes, and everyone was fine. And they're like, oh, sorry, you know, we got stuck getting the other two. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. So after that, I came a little more prepared. Um, so what would happen once they got there? So the guys show up. This day, we had a bunch of uh, Malawian officials coming in to see what's going on. We have a lot of big heavy-duty trucks. They'd um, come down and pick them up by their feet, like you can see with this guy, and put them on a flatbed that has a big rubber mat on it. And here you can see that. Here's the big rubber mat. And we drive then to where our transport and wake-up box is. And here you can see the transport or the wake-up box. And it's about 30% wider than a regular semi-trailer. Because when elephants get up and they're sleeping, they kind of have to kick their back leg. And then they kind of rock up like this and get sternal. And then they stand up. Well, the semi-trailer is too narrow for them to do that. So this thing's a little wider. So what you do is you get them in there. And um, we drive back. And so you'd be driving down the road with two or three elephants on the back of this semi-trailer. And um, one syringe and a bottle of M99 and no gloves. And every 10 minutes, I'd have to top these guys up. So you're doing this. <laughs> like everything we don't do. At this, at this, crawl over an elephant. Given an injection, hold it off with your bare finger, go to the next one and do it. And uh, one time I, I was bent over so long and I stood up and I got all dizzy. I'm like, oh, I've stuck, I've stuck my, because I had to, actually I looked and I had a big cut on my finger with the, the one I was holding off with. 
And so I, I'm like, wait a second, you know, because there's, I, I had the reversal, but I was going to keep that for me. So, um, <laughs> and then I looked at the game guy who was sitting there. I'm like, give me the water. And he's sitting on the water. He's like, yeah, I'm like, no, the water, the water. And he's, oh, okay. And he kind of, I'm like, washed my hands off. And, but I think I just got lightheaded probably because I wasn't drinking much. But um, anyway, so here you can see the elephants. And then the little guys, like this guy, uh, we had just hand inject him, and uh, he was only a couple days old, and I had, to get, I had to stop and get a picture with that one. He was not happy, though. He was screaming up a storm, and the poor little bugger was scared out of his wits. Um, actually, we didn't actually immobilize him. We just gave him some azaparone to kind of calm him down, until, it, and we just put him in with his mom in the back of the uh, truck here. So when we go to wake them up in that transport box, there's maybe three or four elephants in there at a time. So you kind of crawl into the back one. Here's me actually doing work. Here's like a nice posed one. Look, oh, I'm smiling. And um, we must have only done a couple there. So you start at the one in the far end, and you put the, you put the reversals in the ear, but you don't actually push it in. Because you get them all in all the ears. And then you start at the far ones, and you go inject, inject, and you crawl over the neck. Inject, 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 inject. Because as you're kind of coming out of the truck, the first guy's getting up. And that's how quick the reversals work. So you don't want to be going, oh, where's the vein, where's the vein, where's the vein, you know, sticking it in there, because then the guy, other guy's going to get up and get you. So um, you get, got used to it. It was actually pretty, you know, it was pretty straightforward. Plus, their, you know, veins are about that big in their ear. <laughs> and here you can see the mum after. Um, once they got up, we would actually sedate the mums again to make sure they're nice and calm. And you can see the babies were fine and the younger guys, because if the mum was calm, everyone was calm. Um, and then we would go down the road. Here's our truck going down the road in Malawi. And there's a lot of people in Malawi. Um, and once they got to know we were kind of going back and down this road every couple days, we'd stop to make sure the elephants were doing OK. And we would be mobbed by literally 1,000 people. Now, Malawi, the, the population is about 18 million people. Um, and the density is 500 people per square kilometer. So every square kilometer, there's 500 people living subsistence. And they're the nicest people, though. And 99% of those people have never seen an elephant before. They don't live anywhere near. They, you know, they might live 10 miles away, but that's like a long way if you have to walk. So they would run up to the bus and we, truck, and we just tell everyone to be quiet. And they would all look in and look at this. And um, you know, everyone was, you could see the kids were all excited. It was very, very, very cool. So um, Basically, um, we moved those guys down to another park, and we would release them into this other park. And it was very, very exciting because we put about 130 elephants from the one national park over two years into the other national park. And when you're releasing these groups into the other park, it was very nice because all the other elephants there, they would have known. So um, you could see them in this holding pen we had them in for the first night. They could. They communicate subsonically, so you can't really hear most of their communication. It travels a very long distance. So you could see these elephants. They would all be out there, and they'd all just stop and turn and go like this with their ears out, because they're hearing something come from that direction. And we, um, we only had one male break out, and he came back like the next day. Um, but the rest of them never broke out, because they're basically content. They're in a large, very large um, you know, park with uh, very limited elephant supply. So it was very good. So this is kind of the last project I've been working on the last couple of years is hippo anesthesia. And the reason we decided to do this is very difficult to immobilize a hippo. And here you can see why they're quite big. The tough thing with them is, is that they actually, um, they're a diving animal. So they're more like a dolphin or a seal than they are like an elephant. So the weird thing about these animals we don't really understand, they go underwater for long periods of time and they hold their breath, but they can actually move their blood around different in their body. And we don't really understand how they do that. And it's very difficult to anesthetize dolphins as well and, and seals. Very, because what happens is if you give them some of these drugs, like the heavy opioids I was talking about earlier, it just stops them from breathing. They just stop breathing, period. So based on some of the work we did at Disney um, using two other drugs called metatonin and butorphanol, we do that for elephants to get a standing sedation. So we give it to them, and they end up just being anesthetized, but just standing there. Um, and that helps when we are doing some reproduction work and getting babies out and that kind of thing. So I upped the dose a bit, and we started giving it to hippos in South Africa. And no one knew if it would work. And sure enough, it did start to work. The problem is these guys are very difficult um, to get a hold of because they live in the water. So. What we did is we'd scare them. We'd find a, a hippo by itself or in very shallow water, come down with a helicopter and push them out of the water, chase them for a bit, and then dart them. 
and then hopefully they were far enough back from the water. And here you can see this guy went down. So the combination worked really well. They go down in about seven minutes. Usually if we pull the helicopter back, um, they stop running right away and just stand there and then they go down. And here you can see some of our equipment hooked up. I have some pulse oxes hooked up and that tells you how much oxygen is going around. And here's a entitled CO2. We hook that up to your nose or your windpipe to see how much CO2 you're blowing out because we want to make sure these animals are actually doing okay under anesthesia. Because the last thing we want to do is anesthetize them and then have this guy die. Well, they're very difficult to get blood from. There's only two places on a hippo you can get blood. And they're both at the bad ends. The tongue, so unless he's asleep, you're not getting that. And then the other one's right underneath his tail, just like in a cow. So, um, well, it never goes as planned. And so the first uh, one of these guys, we darted on the Crocodile River in Skakuza National Park. It's at the southern boundary of the park. He ran out of the river, and then he ran back through the river. It was only about two feet of water. It was a dry season. And then he disappeared into this reed bed. And when he disappeared into the reed bed, we're like, what's going on? So we landed the helicopter, and we got out. We're starting to walk around looking for this guy. And we came up, and there was a hole in there about this big as, front of the, as big as front of the audi uh, auditorium here. And it was covered with this water height. And so you couldn't see, see water from the air. And he went down in there. So he was in the water. And I'm like, that's it. You know, he's gone because he's going to get anesthetized, and he's in the water. But hippos are very actually interesting. When they sleep at night, they actually go to sleep completely underwater, and they come up and take a big breath, and then they go back down about every five minutes, totally unaware of what they're doing. So we started watching this guy, and he was coming up and taking two breaths and then going back down about every five minutes. So we're like, hey, he's asleep. And so I look, this is Marcus here, and they, always, they never wear shirts over there. I don't know what the deal is. No, well, <laughs> they actually said, well, we better go in and get him. And um, I said, we? <laughs> no, we can't have foreigners getting killed. Okay, good, good. You can go in. Um, so they stripped down, and... Well, we threw a bunch of things into the water first to see if we get any response by other life forms, which could be another hippo, or, you know, more importantly, we were on the Crocodile River in <laughs> Skakuza National Park, and so we had a couple game guards, and uh, they stood by with their rifles, and I said, okay, if, if the water swirls, we're shooting, and so Marcus waded in from the one end, got to where the hippo was, kind of poked it with a stick a couple times, and then ended up getting a rope, and here you can see we're chucking him ropes. Um, around one of its feet, and we dragged it back to the shore and got it about three quarters of the way. Here you can see it coming out of the water. Marcus is uh, trying to take a respiration there. We got it instrumented. We were able to get blood gases on it, take the blood samples, and wake him up um, and a few minutes later, and he ran off. So that was our first water guy, so we were really excited, because this year I'm actually going back. We've done about 15 hippos now, so um, we've got the combination down pat, but we're actually going to go after hippos in the water now. So we're going to take helicopters and go after guys who are actually in the water. But um, we need to kind of find isolated animals because, you know, if there's a bunch of his buddies there, they're not too happy that you're there or plenty of crocodile. But um, with boats and some ropes, we think we can do it because that will be the ultimate test of actually hippo anesthesia and being able to, to work with them in the wild. So previous to this at Disney, we have 18 hippos. We've never been able to anesthetize one. And so I've done this the last two summers. And then this fall, we had a hippo, I was telling you about earlier, cut its foot up really bad. We had to anesthetize it. I had to call Dwayne about it. And then actually Friday before I came here, we had another hippo that had a problem and went down in her back end because she had a spine issue. And we had to immobilize her, and it worked just beautifully. So um, it actually fulfilled our goal, so we're very, very happy. So this is some of our propaganda I had to put at the end. So I want to give some <clears throat> advice to the vet students. And we, were t we talked a little bit today about um, your careers and what you want to do. And so it doesn't matter if you want to be a zoo vet or you want to go own your own private practice or you want to go do you know, fish practice somewhere or, or do whatever. I mean, the thing is, is to really follow your dream and go after what you want. And it doesn't matter what it is, but you need to follow that because... You know, you think, well, it's a lot of work now, but really long term, when you look back on your life, you know, you're still going to go through all that life, so you might as well be doing what you want to be doing, right? And, you know, it is hard work, but, you know, hard work does pay off. And you really need to be dedicated to what you want. And so, Because if, if, if you're not dedicated, you know, even, 
you know, I, we all have bad days. You might be loving what you're doing, but there's going to be some days you're like, what am I doing this for? So if you're not de dedicated to that job, you're going to give up. And, you know, at some point you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit. And a little bit, but um, you might have to sacrifice something for a year, like if you're going to go do an internship, like your life. No, I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> but you've, you know, as my dad said, and he said, it, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? So you really need to do that. But the most important thing I can tell you is you really need to enjoy the journey. Because if you say, oh, you know, I can hardly wait till I'm a boarded zoo vet. I'll tell you, the best times are the times going along. Because those are, you know, you're doing, you're following your goal, you're pursuing something. Yes, there might be some stress. But that's the best part of it. You really need to enjoy that part of, of your life and going through that. Because sometimes you get to the end and you're like, well, that's not really what I thought it was going to be. Um, or it could be. But if you enjoy every day and you enjoy what you're doing every day, it's going to make your life that much more enjoyable the whole way through. You can't be always living in the future. You need to be living in the now. So I would really suggest that you, you know, and I was talking to the students today saying, you know, enjoy your time at the vet school. It's a really good time in your life. Um, all you have to do is really study and, and learn what you want to learn and become a good veterinarian and enjoy the people around you and enjoy your life. It's one of the simplest times in your life. You're very focused at that point uh, because after that, it kind of goes starts going like this. So um, I would really say try and enjoy the journey. So now I'll take some questions. Oh, Jesus. Come on, there's got to be some questions. Does Disney fund all of your research? Yeah, the question was, does Disney fund my research? And yes, that's part of um, the, the CAS conservation program. I've applied for a number of them and been very lucky um, with some of the projects I've done. Uh, a number of our other vets, we have projects all over the world. My boss, Mark Stetter, has been doing an elephant vasectomy project in South Africa. Um, because there's too many elephants, and instead of shooting them, uh, they're doing vasectomies in some of the smaller parks. And it's difficult because their testicles are internal, so it's a laparoscopic procedure in the field. Um, we've done pronghorn relocation um, in the uh, Mexico and Baja Peninsula. Um, we've done ramp rhino translocation. I mean, there's uh, every one of the vets there almost has a project going usually. The Guam rail stuff too. Other questions? Yes, sir. When you go in and you do your research, does Disney film it? The question was, when I go out and do the research, do we film it? They, not so much. We, we've had a couple filmings um, of certain projects. And sometimes it's in, by South African TV. I've been on South African National Geographic a number of times. We usually document it quite a bit. Um, and come back, and uh, whenever I go in the field like that, I try and bring one of our husbandry people. That's the people look after our animals. Like when I go do the hippo stuff, I bring the hippo manager with me. So he sees what's going on there. So if we have a hippo problem, I don't have to try and instruct him. I say, Jay, you know, go do what you have to, and we'll meet at 2, and we'll mobilize the hippo. Um, but um, so I document it, and then we always give what we call brown bag lunches to everyone back at Animal Kingdom to, you know, and the different teams to talk about what we've done so they know what, 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 we're, what we're doing as well. Other questions? Yes, sir. Do you have any comments on Lucy in Edmonton Zoo? Um, the elephant up there? Yeah. You know, it's kind of a sad situation. I, I don't know a lot about it. Actually, someone was telling me today about it. Um, I've heard about it. It's an elephant up at Edmonton Zoo, and I think through a lot of political action, it's, it's getting stuck there. So um, I'm not too sure really about what's the whole story with that. But it would be nice to see that elephant get somewhere with other elephants because they're very smart uh, social animals. Other questions? Way in the back. No, yawning. Okay. Yes, sir. Just for curiosity, what was the diagnosis in the hippo neurological case? Oh, well, that was actually not a good one. Uh, that hippo had had some um, nystagmus issues over the years um, occasionally, and then was having some proprioceptive deficits in the hind end. But when she went down, it looked like a back, uh, a back issue. Um, she could move around with her front feet and whatnot. So this just happened Friday. They actually, we actually had to put her down Saturday because she, she just could not get up. And so, 
you know, we can't let an animal suffer like that. And um, so she was euthanized, and uh, our pathologist actually found a disc issue at L4. Um, but that doesn't explain the nystagmus, so I think there's something else maybe going on. Um, usually when they have these nystagmus things, it's, it, it's in your brain or somewhere bad. Um, so we're waiting on the histo for that. He couldn't see it that. So that was a very sad... Uh, sad events, the first hippo we've lost in maybe 12 years. Um, but, you know, people ask me that. They say, D you know, do animals die? And I'm like, yeah, animals die every day. I mean, it's a large collection. We have probably 2,500 mammals, maybe 20,000 fish. Um, so that's why we have two pathologists. But every single animal that we have dies, um, gets a full necropsy and a full workup, um, every single one. So we're very lucky like that because you can actually... Um, learn a lot about your collection. A lot of the stuff we're running into now is um, geriatric disease issues. A lot of our animals, the park's 12 years old now. We got animals when they're young or middle-aged, so we're getting a lot of, like all our big cats and everything are now hitting geriatric age. And we have lots of arthritis issues and all and that kind of stuff. So um, I'm sure over the next few years we're going to be seeing some more of some of our uh, favorite guys um, get old. Other questions? Come on, there's got to be a few more. Yes? You talked about uh, people being introverted and then having to deal with the public. The yeah, the question was about being introverted and having to deal with the public. Well, we all go through some media training. And um, at Disney, we actually have a university called Disney University. And when you start at Disney, you actually go and have to take a, a bunch of classes there um, on Disney history, Disney culture and how to be a good Disney person. And then that's when they put the microchip in you. They kind of... <laughs> when I went, I heard something about double microchip. I wasn't sure what that meant. But, um, you know, I'll, I think that's a very important thing because um, a lot of vets are introverted. And if you got into this to work with animals, I hate to tell you, um, you're going to be working with people. And <laughs> whether, you know... I mean, the best... If you don't want to work with animals, I mean, the closest thing you can do is be a radiologist, Right? And I'm one of my best friends from undergrad is here, and he's a human radiologist. So, um, no, but seriously, I mean, you're going to be dealing with people. And vet schools are very, very good at polishing the science skills on you guys, right? But the other thing you have to do is you really need to polish your soft skills. Um, and what I mean by that is your personality, how you treat people, how you deal with people, how you deal with your technicians, how you deal with customers and your clients and everything. Because that's the thing that people are going to remember. And so, um, unfortunately, it's tough for some people. And it was never hard for me. I'm extroverted, so I like being around people, so it's been easy that way. But if not, and you're going to go like be in private practice seeing you know, 20 people a day, you better be able to talk to people. Because if you, if you can't talk with people, um, you're not going to get your point across. They're not going to know what you're going to do. You, you, know, you won't be able to get your medicine across. So you basically have to force yourself to learn how to be a little more extroverted. Um, and I think it's very important. And I know a number of vets around me that say, well, they're introverted, but they've learned how to become extroverted as far as working with people. And um, so I think that's a very important point. Uh, Tim's question was, do we do any other work inside the park other than being a veterinarian? And the question is, yes. At Disney, we are a team. That's what they tell us anyways. No, uh, we are a team. And the team is not just the people you work with. We are all one team. And it's one of the few places I know that I actually do this. So a couple times a year during our really busy seasons, which are Christmas, um, American Thanksgiving, well, American Thanksgiving through Christmas, and then around Easter, when, for example, a normal day in our park might be 25,000 people, it would be 45,000 people that day. Um, they ask for management level people to go help the frontline people. Um, it's called cross utilization, we call it cross you. So um, the first time I signed up for it, they just say, show up at this place and you'll be told what to do. So I showed up at the place and uh, lucky I did lots of bad jobs when I was a kid. My dad forced me um, to go so I realized what a good job I have. Is they said, okay, well, do you mind uh, picking up garbage? I'm like, no, I'll do it, whatever. So I was like, oh no. So I had to be the little person with the dustpan sweeping. So they said, I talked to the other lady there, and she said, okay, we'll start at the front of the park and go all the way back to, like, the Tree of Life, and you can make this big circle, and it takes about an hour. And I had four hours to do it. So I'd already worked all day, and it was just, like, four to eight. I said, okay. 
So I went out there and started sweeping, and you know, every little, you know, I could tell you exactly what people were throwing out, and these stupid little twist ties they must have on some kind of candy. There's like millions of them. So you're going through, sweep, 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 sweep. So I made the first round, and then I went and did the whole thing again, and I got back, and I looked at my watch, and I did it in like two laps in 40 minutes. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so, um, but it was actually very interesting because, you know, when I walk through the park in my normal outfit, um, People know after a while, or you know, I'm coming through with scrubs, it says Dr. Greg on it. Uh, we don't go by our last names there, everyone's on a first name basis. So they see you're the vet and you're doing stuff. And you don't really get you know, a lot of hello out of them because uh, they're busy doing their job. But when I was there doing that, it was funny that a lot of the guests, no, none of the guests saw you, you were like invisible, it was the weirdest thing. But all the other people doing those jobs were like, hey, like all of a sudden, there, you know. And so it was actually good because it, it made me realize, you know, hey, I get to go in every day and do this really cool job. I never know what I'm going to do. You know, it changes from day to day. And my day goes by like that. Like I go to work and the next thing I know, it's 6 o'clock, you know. Um, and so it's actually really been good to do that. And you get to know the people. And I've had a lot of those people come back now. Um, and ta I take them behind the scenes at the hospital and stuff. Um, but that has been very good to kind of do that. And so I do that a couple, three or four times a year. And I do, um, now I actually do with one guy that helps me do some of these big tours I do. I do a lot of parade control. So um, I'm very good at, all right, people, this way, this way. <laughs> Kilimanjaro safaris, this way. Double point, um, smiling. <laughs> so um, double point, this way. Uh, where's the bathroom? Right over there. Um, so, but you know, it's good, though. I mean. We're no different than those guys, really. So um, it's been very good. It's, it's actually, uh, it, it, it's good, because they see you there. And then when you go through the park, now I get, hey, hey, Dr. Greg, all over the place. And not everyone does it. We're supposed to, but not everyone does. So any other? Yes, Donna. Um, do you have doctors and staff 24 hours a month? Do you have hospital or clinics? Or do you have people on call? Or how does that function? Yeah. The question was, do we have like people there 24-7? Well, we actually have husbandry staff there 24-7. And what I mean by husband, they're the people who look after animals. We have a night team. So at about 5 o'clock, the night man, three night managers and about 26 night keepers come in. And they, because um, a lot of our stuff gets done at night. So if they need to go out on the safari and dig up a hole or do something or they do, or all the... Um, you know, plant people come in at night to replant stuff. They have to do that at night, and they have to be supervised by animal people because there could be loose animals in those areas. But as far as the vets go, um, we're just on call just like it would be here. So um, we're, it's pretty good. I rarely get called in. Um, you know, I'm probably only on one night a week and probably every sixth or seventh weekend because there's enough of us. Um, so it's pretty good. And then usually if you get called in, you know something's go you, you probably know before you leave work something bad's going down. Or we're going to have an elephant baby or, or, or. So um, um, I actually live only about 15 minutes from Disney, so I can get there pretty fast. And um, I had a fast car for the longest time, and so I could get there in about eight minutes if I pushed it. Um, but I ne I've been the first one to all the five elephant births we've had recently and uh, never seen one. They're calling me, she's pushing. We can see the lump. I'm like, vroom, vroom. the old Audi firing down the highway. Um, and whenever I've got there, they've already got the baby in hand. So, um, but yeah, no, it's been good. And uh, occasionally we get called in for, we do a lot of wildlife work. Anything wildlife on all of Disney property we see as well. I'd say the average time I get called in is to probably euthanize a deer that's been hit by a car. That's what happens more than not, because someone hits it, and then our pest management people, you know, someone reports it, and, you know, they've got broken legs, and I just go, probably have to euthanize it. But, um, yeah. Yes, Leanne. You talked about things being intense sometimes while I go from a danger perspective. What are a couple of the animals that you work with that you think are the most dangerous, or, you know, people get really worked up about, about having to... To knock down or whatever. Tex with low amount of coffee, that's yeah. one. Um, <laughs> uh, they're hearing me, I know it, I'm gonna get it. Um, well, you know, we don't put ourselves in dangerous, you know, situations really. I mean, some of the more dangerous situations would be working around some of the elephants, and it's not because they're so much trying to get you, it's that they're just so big. And so when we're ultrasounding them um, and we're doing pararectal ultrasound, you know, she's 10,000 pounds. And if she goes like this or something, um, you're going to feel it. 
Um, but, but we've trained them pretty well, and they're pretty good, and we de desensitize them to it. And, and the girls are really good, actually, uh, the elephants. So um, usually you come up and talk to them first, because they know what's going on. You just say, you know, they know you're there. They know you're the vet. Um, and different people exude different aura, because some vets will um, come in, and I don't know what it is. You've either got it or you don't. You'll come in, and the elephants are or some other vets, maybe not so much. And they're more relaxed. I think if you're relaxed, they're relaxed. Because if you're relaxed, your techs are relaxed, everyone's relaxed around you. And, and I always tell everyone, you know, when you're doing procedures, um, it's good to be the calm person. And that's hard for me, because I'm not a calm person, um, to be the calm person and lead the way like that. Because if you're calm, everyone's calm. And everyone's cool and collective. If you're worked up and aggressive and not having a good day, it goes down the line. So, and the animals feel that too, and they know. Um, so, but the best thing about Disney really is that behavioral husbandry department I've talked about, and I don't want them to hear that because I'm always giving them grief. Um, but um, you know, they've trained these animals so we don't get in dangerous situations, and safety is actually our priority. We, you know, the things that we get most injuries by are squirrels. Um, that people bring in that are semi-comatose, and then, you know, the wildlife intern gives it some fluids, and the next day they go to get it because he was comatose the day before, and the thing like leaps at them. Um, small, small things, because big things people are like, whoa, but little tiny things people get nailed by. Naked mole rats, they're another one. You tend to get bit, and the, the key with small things is not flinching, because if you, a lot of times, if little things bite you, and you go, oh, and they go. So you've got to be able to take the hit and just go, ah, get him off. Get the hydrogen peroxide. Because if you spray hydrogen peroxide in their mouth, they go, whoa, what was that? Um, I've had to do that many a times and bear down. So um, yeah, little things. It's the little things, always. And there was another question somewhere right around. Oh, yes. How, how similar is the, like, the safari to real life? Is there lines like chasing it is, Who's been there? Anyone? Look at that, yeah. I'll come down because it keeps me employed. No, um, <laughs> well, it's very real. You're out, um, the trucks are big, so there's about 50 people on a truck. Um, but, and they look pretty good, um, but this, the stuff they have them on is all what we call themed. So it all looks like you're kind of in Africa, but even though they've themed this stuff really bad, I mean, it's still good stuff in Africa. I mean, they, you never see that just riding on the top, somebody protecting that very well. So it's very good like that, and you're out in the open with all the animals, and they're all around you, and it's all mixed. And when you go up, you'll see cheetah, and you see um, lion, and they look like they're right there on that rock. But what you don't see is the big moat between it. So it's all perspective. It's field of view. So people think all these animals are in together. And the, not, the carnivores are there, and they can see the other stuff, but they can't get to them. And you don't see any fences or anything on, on the main safari. And, uh, you know, they say you're going on a three-day kind of thing through there. And um, it's about a 20, 25-minute ride. And so they're all driven individually through this thing. But they put through um, one of those trucks every 42 seconds or something. So they're very efficient. So the problem is you'll hear um, Kilimanjaro one, and they're like, Someone come down here, there's a giraffe in the path, because they'll pull up, and if a giraffe's standing there, they can't go, get out of the way. So this giraffe will just stand there. <laughs> or lick the, the you, hear, you hear goofy stuff all the time, like, the giraffe is licking the windshield. Um, <laughs> and then someone responds, one of the keepers, and they're in a themed truck like they're a game ranger, and they'll kind of drive over there, and the giraffe will go, okay, move off. You know? So you hear that all the time. Holding for rhinos at the Red River Rock or whatever, and so someone's got to go out there and get the rhinos to move, because there's like 10,000 million more guests behind them coming. Um, so we've got to get them through the ride, yeah. And sometimes some of those animals, we actually have to go out there. Like the Tommies are particularly, Tommies are Thompson's gazelles. They're really tiny. They're only about this big. Um, we have to go out there and actually dart them on, on, on the savanna because they don't want to come in. They like it so much out there. And so if we have a dystocia or something, if they see the vet truck coming, gone. So basically what we have to do is you have to lay down in the safari truck in the first one in the morning. And as it drives up and at the last minute, you kind of... And you basically have one shot, and it's basically like the wild, because once that shot misses, they're like, Phew, gone, and that's, you're not going to get another shot that day. So um, you, get, you get good 
and luckily I grew up in Alberta with a 22 and I was pretty proficient. So um, I, I actually really liked darting and, and doing it. But, you know, you do mess up darting. And one of my uh, mentors said, you know, if you haven't uh, messed up darting, you haven't been darting long enough. And uh, it's true. Um, well, when I was doing my residency, we had to mobilize. This is a place called White Oak Plantation. It's in northern Florida. They have a herd of about 30 zebra, and we have this thing called Zebra Week. And we mobilize all the zebra in one week. So I was going through darting. We're on the last zebra. I darted all of them on the first shot. So, I, you know, the guys were torturing me, um, the husbandry guys. I'm like, you know, I'd be Hall of Fame, you know, if I was in baseball, 99%. So the last zebra is about a yearling filly. And I go to darter, I'm looking, it's all solid wood panels except these holes about this big. So all the bu her buddies are out in the field behind us and I've, she's running back and forth. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll do the same pattern in the stall. So what you do is you just fixate on one point and then you wait for them to come up to that point. And they usually pause for a second in the same exact place every time. So you concentrate on that point and then they just kind of come into your field of view and then you squeeze off. Well, she's coming into my field of view and I'm like, gotcha. And just as I was squeezing off, her mom behind me is like, and then, <laughs> bonk, got her right between the eyes. And I was like, 100%, because <laughs> I was. I didn't hit an eyeball. You got to look at it the good way. She literally took two steps and just dropped, because it went right into her sinuses, which are full of blood. She dropped like a rock. And all the guys were laughing, and they're like, unicorn, unicorn. And, <laughs> I didn't care. I was a, I'm a hundred percent baby. I don't care what you guys say. Um, I was just like, ooh, not an eyeball. Um, so yeah. Um, and actually, the other day, we had a zebra that had an abscess on its butt, and it kept reoccurring, reoccurring. So we finally immobilized it, and um, we went to X-ray, and there was a dart tip in her, and. We kind of, it was, I'm like, when was that? Because, you know, you're thinking back who did it. And actually, Deidre, one of the other vets I was working with, confessed that she did it. Um, and so it was an aluminum thing. We ended up getting, getting it out. But it was like, because the darts, sometimes the darts explode and you can't find them and find pieces of them. And especially that dart had a gunpowder charge in it. And uh, so the zebra, lucky it was a zebra because they're basically indestructible. So, um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, we got, we got to bug Deidre about darting, so. And, uh, you know, so the, the keepers heard that I'd kind of done this darting, at, and some of the same keepers were at Disney that when I was at Whiteout. And the first week we went out, and I had to dart one of these Tommies off the Savannah. So, of course, I was a new guy, and they're like, new guy, go dart the Tommy. <laughs> you know, they didn't tell me, so I got there, I'm going to dart this Tommy. So I go to dart, and she's standing in front of this brush pile, and just as I squeezed off, she heard that it's a gunpowder charge, this one, she's like about 100 yards away. So it goes, pop, and when... I did that, she went uh, like that, and it, she just squatted a bit, and it just missed her back, and nailed some of her hair to a log right behind it. <laughs> I'm like, and then phew, gone. So I was like, oh, we'll come back tomorrow. And I come back to my office about two hours later, and they took a chainsaw and cut that, cut that log off with the dart, and put it on my desk, and, they, and there was a little note saying, you know, we think this is ready to intubate now. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. So. You can't take yourself too seriously, ever, because um, you'll get told pretty quick. So, uh, so that's a very important thing, too. You know, no matter how good you are, there's always someone better, and you're going to screw it up someday. So um, don't be too confident. Um, try and be a little bit humble some days. I, I don't know if I should probably listen to my own advice sometimes. But any other questions? La oh, there's two more people. We'll take these last two. Right there. What type of creatures add up in the <laughs> That is cool. Who knows what that is? Liam Pack. It's a turtle. Very good. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it lives in the southeast United States. <laughs> Leanne. It, it they, eat it, they eat it in Louisiana. It, that's an alligator snapping turtle. And that's actually really cool. They're, they only come from the southeast United States. It's the largest freshwater turtle in the world. And they're the ones, they have the tongue that moves like this. When they're li Well, they have it. You can kind of see it there. They, they lie in wait, and their tongue moves like this, and fish will swim in, and the thing just goes wham and grabs it. But they get huge. This male was 201 pounds. And um, I, we, this was in my residency at University of Florida. You see, I'm smiling very a lot in that picture. I was quite happy. 
they, I got a call from the wildlife guys one night and they said, hey, we've got this turtle. And normally we didn't do emergency wildlife receiving at night because it was just, it, the residency was very intense with people coming in. So they would just bring in the wildlife stuff the next day and they said, we've got this huge turtle. I'm thinking, mm-hmm, because you know, people say huge and it's like this big. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 but its front feet are as big as a bear claw. And I knew right then, I'm like, I'm like bring it in, bring it in. So she brought it in and they had this guy and... <laughs> They had it wrapped up in a quilt with rope. <laughs> but someone, these, these, these southern guys, and I'll use the term loosely rednecks, um, found this guy on the road, and he had a noose around his neck. And so someone had hooked him, probably, and was going to eat him. And I think he was in the back of their truck, and he crawled out. And I think he landed on his back because he kind of got scraped a bit. And you could see um, right there, he kind of had some road rash a bit. And uh, he had some blood coming out of his mouth. But anyway, so they had this thing, and they saw it, and they did the right thing. They called the wildlife rehabber, and she told them to bring him to the vet school. So they drove like an hour and a half, these guys, and they had an old pickup truck. So they get this thing out, and it was wrapped in a quilt with rope around it. And they think, I think this thing's dead. And I said, why do you think? Well, he's just lying there with his mouth open. I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, so we had it in the ward. I wasn't really listening to the guy. And he goes, yeah, it's dead. And I said, well, why do you think that? He goes, well, I had a bunch of leeches in his mouth, and I was picking them out. I'm like, you did what? He goes, I was picking them out. And this thing, they lie there when they're under, like, I could have fit both my hands in its mouth. And I said, you are picking them out of its mouth, eh? He goes, yeah, I got them all out. And I said, watch this. So I took a broom handle, and I just went, boop, and it went, and just, like, crunched the broom handle. It didn't cut it in half, but it destroyed it, and the guy just went white. <laughs> I said, you lucky boy. He went, uh-huh, Because um, <laughs> when in Rome, you have to speak Roman, right, Leanne? Right, Leanne's from the South, so. Um, yeah, so anyways, this poor snapping turtle, we actually um, took him and x-rayed him, because I, I was afraid we were going to find a hook somewhere down in his esophagus, but we actually didn't, and he did fine, and um, the biologist from University of Florida came over, and we took some blood samples from him, and they've done so much work on this particular species. They're only in the southeast United States, and they only come to the Suwannee River in Florida, which is about halfway through Florida. They've got, done so much work that they've, the genetics, they knew exactly which three-mile stretch of river he came from, from his genetics. And he's the second largest one they'd ever seen. So they came about a week later and took him and took him back and put him back in the wild. So I'm very happy about that one. And this other one... This was when I was in South Africa. My, uh, another guy I met over there the first time was doing his master's on wild dogs. And he actually is a, uh, runs a big game farm now. And so I always usually spend a couple days when I go there with him. They have all the game on there. And uh, I always ask his guys, and here is guys. Um, these guys are Zulu, and this guy's actually from Mozambique. And... Um, they're really good game trackers. Like these are the guys that you know they go along the floor, and they, they you could leave here and they'd be able to track you, because um, they do a lot of hunting at this place. So um, anyway, so I was talking about snakes. I'm like, you know, I want to see the snake, and they're like, no, no, no. And then Gunther's my buddy, got a call. He says, oh, the guys found a big snake, eh? And I said, don't, you know, where are they? Oh, it's over by the dam. So we went and got the guys. It was about an hour ago though, because they just came back, and we drove back over there. And this is an African rock python. They're one of the largest uh, snakes in the world. So we get down there, and uh, we, we fan out. And the ground is really dry and hard, and they're like, and then I heard a guy go, whistle that he found it. He said there was two, so he said they were all wrapped up, so I'm sure they're mating. So we actually ended up finding this one, and it was sitting in this grass that's only maybe, it's not, you can see it there. I mean, you can almost see my feet. And he was kind of in the grass, and you could barely see it. And I was like, sweet. So I'm like, I'm going to grab this thing. And I, Gunther, I want you to take a picture. And he's like, no, 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 man. I, I'm not touching it. And I said, well, just take the picture. So I told the other guys, I'm like, guys, you got to help me grab the snake. And they're all like, no. <laughs> and the little guy, though, he was from Mozambique. And uh, so he could speak Portuguese. Um, and um, so he actually told me that he used to catch, he was a snake catcher in his village, so he wasn't scared. So the other guy said, okay, I said, look, I'm going to get the head, and when I grab the head, you guys help me with the body, because I just didn't want it kind of constricting me. And, and, Gun <laughs> and, Gunter, and Gunter had the camera. I said, Gunter, take the picture quick, because, you know, if this thing starts going ballistic, I'm going to let it go. And he says, okay. Because a lot of times you'll grab them, and about two seconds later, then they just go to town. And this thing was big. So he said, okay. So I, I went over, and I kind of poked it with a stick. 
Um, and then I just grabbed the head. And you can see I grabbed it and I didn't let go because there's still grass stuck around my hand. So once you get a hold of, baby, you never let go. And so I got in, it was, it, the snake was calm and it was pretty warm out. So I called the guys over and they all like came and took the picture. And you can see this guy here, um, <laughs> he didn't take his eyes off that thing the whole time. <laughs> And the other guys are all like laughing, and I've known these guys for about 10 years. So I went back, and we, I actually printed off the picture for him on my buddy's computer, and I went back and gave it to him. And they're all laughing because, you know, these guys were really cool. They're game guards, but, you know, if you live in Africa and you don't live in a house where you can seal the doors and stuff, you know, snakes come in, and there's, most of them are venomous, and people die from them all the time. So really snakes, you know, people see snakes, they don't like them. But these guys know they can tell what a cobra is or whatever. They would never kill one. They can appreciate it. So it was actually, they're actually really cool about it. Um, but they had never grabbed a big python like this before. So they were um, very um, happy after. And we were all laughing about this, uh, this African rock python. But she was, she was just mint. I mean, that's a spectacular snake there. So uh, I was quite happy. That's one of the life checks there. So anyways. And think one more question there, young man. Well, sometimes we have, a, we have program. The question was, do people from this school come to Florida? And sometimes they do. Um, if you're a dean, you get a tour for sure. <laughs> if you're important faculty. Um, uh, but we've had some vet students come from here. We have what we call a preceptorship during their senior year you can apply for. And we take a number of those. And I'm always on the watch out for Canadians. Don't tell the people down there that. Um, and uh, so we've had a couple people from ABC actually come through the program, yeah. So maybe one day you can come down. There you go. All right, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. On behalf, oh, I didn't put right. On behalf of all of the student, alum, or student body and ABC and the student union, we have a little gift for you. Right, thanks. Thanks for being here and no giving this awesome talk. Thanks. All right. Yeah.